This is going to be the next episode of God's Game of Thrones. And we're looking at Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And this is going to be called In the Eyes of the Wicked. And last time we talked about how Obadiah runs into Elijah. And Elijah wants Obadiah to go get Ahab and tell him, Behold, Elijah is here. And now Ahab is going to go meet Elijah. First off, in the eyes of the wicked, you are the reason for trouble. You're the reason for all their trouble. In 1 Kings 18, 16 through 18, it says, So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet him, went, went to meet Elijah. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Isn't that interesting that Ahab asks Elijah, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. So the wicked men in this world honestly believe that it's the saints that are holding them back. They believe the saints are the ones causing them trouble. And this is why they want rid of you. We are resisting the next step of their fake evolution. When a man preaches a hard sermon, when he preaches on the street, when he witnesses, when he gives out a track, or stands against the wiles of the devil, the lost world thinks we are causing trouble. We are the trouble to them in the eyes of the wicked. The church is standing in the way of people completely having their sin city or their sin country. Uh, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. This nation wants to be a place where anything goes. And since the saints stand against that, they label us as trouble. And to them we must be eliminated so that we don't hold up their progress. We are the trouble. In the eyes of the wicked, you are the reason for all the trouble. And Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Ahab puts evil for good and good for evil. He says Elijah is trouble. But Elijah rebukes him and says, It's not me, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Ahab is the troubler of Israel just like the Antichrist will be in the tribulation. He forsook the commandments of the Lord. He followed Balaam. This country has forsaken the commandments of the Lord. They follow atheists. They follow sex perverts. They follow the evolution crowd, the Satanists, and anyone who thinks anything goes because, you know, we evolved from animals, so we are animals to them. They are the troublers of this country, not us. But in the eyes of the wicked, you're... The reason for trouble. And next, you're a religious cult. You're the reason for trouble, and you're a religious cult. When the lost world sees a saint who acts like a true born-again believer, they will be mind-blown. Uh, they will say that a Bible preacher is leading a religious cult. They think you are abnormal. They think you are orchestrating something that is troubling to society. They think you are causing the people in your congregation to drink the Kool-Aid. They will spread rumors to make lost people who have common sense. There are some lost people with common sense. And the ones without common sense will spread rumors to the ones with common sense to even begin to doubt you themselves. This is, this many times becomes just, the, the this is why there's so much trouble in society. Because the Christian is made out to be the the enemy and so everybody turns against him and they go against the bible they go against the truths of the bible they go against the people that are only out to help you and they become for the people that are against them and many times a true bible believing crowd is so much the minority that they think you're a bunch of crazies but elijah says in first kings eighteen nineteen, now therefore send and gather to me all israel and to mount carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So in this story, you've got about 850 men versus one, which is Elijah. And Elijah was taking on an army. But one man and God is the majority, as they say. To those prophets of Baal, in the eyes of those wicked prophets of Baal, Elijah was an outcast. He was a strange little man. 
In 1 Peter 4, 4, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. They think it's strange. And they think you are a religious cult. They think Elijah would just be a cult leader. So, 1 Kings 18, 22, Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Elijah was such a loner that he thought he was the only one left. He just didn't realize it, that there were other God-fearing people. In Romans 11, 2 through 4, it shows you that at that time the Lord had reserved to himself 7,000 men that were like Elijah who had not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. I mean, they may not have been as sold out as Elijah was, but there were seven other like-minded people that Elijah didn't even realize was there. So you're never really alone. But in the eyes of the wicked, a group of Bible-believing people are just a cult. And even in the eyes of many Christians, many Christian people, these teachings I put out in their eyes are just cult-like. I profess to believe that a book is perfect, and they would say I'm part of the King James Onlyism cult. Have you ever heard that? Or the Ruckmanite cult. Just because I believe the Bible's perfect, and Ruckman believed the Bible was perfect, and led, led many other people to believe that the Bible's perfect. But they say that that's cult-like, because we believe in a perfect Bible. So in their eyes, I'm the reason for trouble. In their eyes, I'm in a religious cult. And next, this also leads them to believe I'm ridiculously extreme. They thought Elijah was a ridiculously extreme. They think you are too if you are a sold-out Bible believer. In 1 Kings 18, 20 through 21, it says, And Ahab sent to all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel, and Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? What a great line. How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. So these people were professing to be for God when it was convenient. But they were for Baal the rest of the time. So Elijah says, How long halt ye between two opinions? How long are you going to have a foot in the Bible and how long are you going to also have a foot in the world at the same time? How long are you going to stay politically correct? If you're going to be for God, then follow him. And if you're going to be for the devil, then follow him. Following both is just confusion. And it confuses your kids. Some people are going to church every time the doors are open, but they have nothing to do with God at all outside of that. And I have more respect for the people who don't go to church but love God every day and stay in the book every day. Because, you know, most uh, most preachers are so hard on the people who are out of church, but many times the people out of church are in the book and the people in church are out of the book. I mean, that's not always true. But, you know, not everybody lives in the Bible Belt like, with a good Bible-believing church up the street like I do, and I understand that. A lot of my listeners don't have a Bible-believing church around them. So I don't just beat them up the head, side of the head all day saying that they're out of the will of God for not being in church because they're just going to have to go to a church teaching just out, outrageously crazy things where they live. Maybe they have to be a loner like Elijah because they can't find anyone to fellowship with. And a, a lot of men forget that not everyone is in the situation that they are in. Not everyone has all the pieces in place where they can go to a good Bible-believing church and be there every time the doors are open. And I understand that. 1 Kings 18, 22, Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Sometimes it feels like you are in this fight all alone, but you're really not. And even though Elijah was by himself, I mean, look how confident he is in this story. But you're never really alone. In 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. To this world you are ridiculously extreme. But the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You think you're going through something and you're the only one going through it? The same affliction is going on with all these other Christians in the world. You just don't know about it. 
But this world, they think you are a ridiculously extreme and in a religious cult. They don't believe you need to give everything to God. They don't believe you need to just go ahead and surrender your life to Him. They think it's good and right to halt between two opinions. In 1 Kings 18, 20 through 21, So Ahab sent to all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together into Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. What if the president got all the big shot evangelists, TV preachers, high class news anchors, and famous false prophets of our day together in Joel Osteen's church and just let a redneck hillbilly with a King James Bible Get up there behind the pulpit. What would happen? Imagine if they couldn't leave and just had to sit there and listen to Danny Castle and Donnie Dalton or Steve Sturgeon or old school field kid, all those fake evangelists and TV preachers. They would die. They would hate every second of it. That is like what happens here. Elijah is getting up in front of all these guys. He's telling the king what to do. And the king gathers all those false prophets together, and to all those men, Elijah is ridiculously extreme. He is in a religious cult. He is the reason for their trouble. First Kings eighteen twenty three through 24, Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. So Elijah is about to show them that they have the wrong little g gods. They have their confidence in the wrong little g god. 1 Kings eighteen twenty five and 26, And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first, for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning, even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leaped upon the altar which was made. So there is no answer from their god. Because you know why? Their God is a fraud. He's a fake. He's a phony. He's not real. Revelation 9.20 talks about these false gods that people have can neither see nor hear nor walk. There are millions of people praying to a false God that doesn't even hear them. These guys are saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. Now the devil, he could have came through and performed a miracle here. And I'm sure he would have loved to. But I believe this is one of those cases where where God probably had him on a tight leash or maybe the devil himself chose to just leave these false prophets when they needed him the most and nobody said nothing their god didn't show up he didn't say anything and it says they leaped upon the altar which was made like a rock rock concert or something with those guys jumping all over the stage maybe they are trying to psych something up here they believe elijah is ridiculously extreme look at them look at how they are acting look at the people of this world if they don't get their way if the people in this world the people in this world that say that you are ridiculously extreme in your beliefs many of them if they don't get their way they burn down buildings they steal stuff they run people over at rock concerts they jump up and down scream holler and know every word to every song everyone is ridiculously extreme about something but paul says in galatians 4 18 but it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing but people are extreme and zealous in bad things so the so in the eyes of wicked men you are the reason for the trouble in this world you are part of a religious cult and are ridiculously extreme and next you're rude and intolerant in first kings eighteen twenty seven, and it came to pass at noon that elijah mocked them and said cry aloud for he is a god either he is talking or he is pursuing or he is in a journey or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. When Bell slept, Bell was asleep, Bell slept in, Elijah begins to mock the prophets of Bell. It said Elijah mocked them. He says either he is talking, pursuing, or a journey, or just asleep. We don't know where he is, but he didn't show up, Elijah says. Elijah is saying all this stuff in a mocking way to this world This type of thing is rude and intolerant. So they think he's in a religious cult. He's the reason for their trouble. He's ridiculously extreme. He
He's rude and intolerant. But Elijah wasn't tolerant of anything, as you're going to see soon. And in Revelation 2, 2, God commends people for their intolerance. He says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. God commends you for your intolerance of evil. Saints shouldn't tolerate open, blatant, unrepentant, God-defying sin and false beliefs like these prophets of Bel had. My go-to go thing personally isn't mockery or being sarcastic or rough with people. That's just not my personality. But for some men, that is their personality. And God uses that type of personality like he did with Elijah here. And when you talk against uh, individual sins in this day and time, you become rude and intolerant in the eyes of wicked men. Really, they can't tolerate you either. They would rather save all the duckbill platypuses in this world over you. If it was between you and the duckbill platypuses going extinct, then you're going to be extinct and the duckbill platypuses are going to be on a throne somewhere. Uh, they, they would rather save one species of soon-to-be-extinct rodents than to preserve the lives of a Bible believer because we don't tolerate their sin. The thing that gets the Bible believers in, in trouble and martyred with the world is their intolerance. I never understood Christians who get mad at a preacher for calling extremely wicked people names or mocking them or downing them. They are more mad at the preacher than they are at the wicked men who are in the business of damning souls to hell. But another thing, in the eyes of a wicked man, your results are harmful to self. The results that come from what you're doing, they believe are harmful to yourself and others. In the, in the wicked man's eyes, he thinks that anything that comes from your results is self-defeat. This one guy said, what you're saying is so self-defeating. He said, you're just going to make people down on their self. He said, no wonder people self-harm. This is because, you see, they say this because the Bible believers believe that man at his best state is altogether vanity. Bible believers believe that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't know, I don't, I don't believe I know of a Bible believer that does self-harming like this person accused and I mean, I feel for people who do. I pray for them and they just need the Lord in their life. But what a Bible believer teaches is not leading you to self-harm. That isn't a result of the Bible. God never teaches you to do penance and, and hurt yourself. God doesn't want a blood sacrifice from you. Jesus Christ shed his blood for you. He doesn't want you shedding it for your own sins. But now the world and its beliefs and its cults and its liars and its God wants you to self-harm. He wants you to hurt yourself. And that's what these prophets of Baal do. They think Elijah is rude and intolerant. They think he, he, the results of his ministry are harmful to self. But look what they do in 1 Kings 18, 28. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after the manner, after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. Bible believers don't promote junk like that. That is the world's stuff. They promote the self-harm. And I heard Danny Castle say one time that the devil counterfeits God and he wants a blood sacrifice, but he wants it from you. God sacrificed himself. He shed his own blood for you. The devil wants blood from you. Did you ever think about the fact that one of the first things the Lord tells Noah when he gets off the ark is not to eat blood? What were they doing before the flood? What were the people doing before the flood with blood? The next thing the wicked man sees when he looks at you is that your road is too narrow for him. He thinks you're rude and intolerant. He thinks your results are harmful. He thinks you're in a religious cult, ridiculously extreme, and your road is too narrow. In 1 Kings 18, 25, And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first, for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. Elijah tells them to call on the name of their gods. And there are many broad roads to hell, but the road to eternal life is one road and a narrow road. You can't just put your faith in any god to get eternal life. It has to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. When you go around teaching that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that nobody comes to the Father but by Him, then you aren't going to be popular in the eyes of wicked men. If you believed on Jesus Christ, then you are on the good and narrow way. 
in First Kings eighteen twenty nine, and it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. Those little G gods aren't going to regard you now. They won't be able to get you out of hell if you die without Jesus Christ, the God of all gods. Your road is too narrow for many w wicked men today. And your reality is an obsession. You know what they say about you? They, they think your reality is an obsession. In 1 Kings 18, 30 through 31, notice something about Elijah. It says, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. Notice that everything Elijah does has, to, has something to do with the Lord. He prepared the altar of the Lord. The, the number of stones he took had to do with the things of God because he took 12 stones to go along with the 12 tribes of Israel. And then he, and he uh, with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord and built a trench about the altar. It, he even built the altar in the name of the Lord. This is the reality of of a Bible believer. Everything we do revolves around the book. Everything that comes up gets filtered through the book. You might be a Bible believer if you're, you name your kids' Bible names. You might be a Bible believer if you get the Bible, if you got the Bible in every room, on your phone, in your car, in your bathroom, and pretty much everything you do revolves around the Bible. It is your reality. It's all real. You believe it is real, and people can tell, but they think your reality, that's your reality. And they think it's an obsession. People tell me many times what other people say about me. And they say, uh, they say, well, that, that, you know what that guy said about you? He said, man, that guy's obsessed with all that Bible stuff. They say, he's got all those Bible verse magnets on his car. He's obsessed. He's extreme. They say, he, get, he gives out those little papers with Bible verses. They say, that's so silly. Why does he do that? But it is true, I am obsessed. It's what's on my mind. It's what my mind is always on. Now, what, no matter what I'm doing, it just reminds me of something that's in the Bible. I have to watch myself because sometimes I'll be thinking about the Bible and I didn't, even, even, I didn't even hear anything my wife just said. It just went in one ear and out the other. And I know that something in my brain heard what she said, so I'll just sit there for a minute before I ask her to repeat what she said and just maybe the part of my brain that heard it will let me know before it's too late. But I mean, I'm, I am obsessed with the Bible. I am, I am really, but it is my reality. But the wicked men look at you and say, your reality is really an obsession. They also say you're relying on a fairy tale for grown-ups. In the eyes of wicked men, you're relying on a fairy tale for grown-ups. That's what they thought about Elijah. In 1 Kings 18, 33 through 37, it says, And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces. And laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran around about the altar. And he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant. And I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Those false prophets of Baal saw Elijah pray at that moment, and they were probably laughing. They were probably saying, does he really think that God is going to hear just one strange little man like himself? They thought he was relying on a fairy tale for grown-ups, even though what they were relying on was way more stupid. They were calling on Baal. I mean, the people look at you like you're crazy today. You, they think God is a fairy tale, yet they think they came from a rock. I mean, they're true hypocrites. And this is what the world thinks when they look at you. And in 2 Peter 3, 3 through 4, it says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So they're looking at you. They're, they, they see you. And hear you saying Jesus is coming soon, and they scoff, and they 
They say you're relying on a fairy tale for grown-ups, but then the fairy tale happens. In 1 Kings 18, 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. One of these days, after the tribulation time period, Jesus Christ is coming in the clouds and he is going to come in flaming fire taking vengeance and the fire will lick up everything just like it did here. And one day everyone will see it. And it says in 1 Kings 18, 39, And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. In Revelation 1, 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. The fairy tale became a reality to them. And the fairy tale that you, that they think you're believing in, it's going to become a reality to them. But in the meantime, the next thing they say about you is, you think you're right and everybody else is wrong. You ever heard them say that? You think you're so right and everybody else is wrong. In 1 Kings 18.40, it says, And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal and let none of them escape. And they took them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. Now Elijah is operating under the physical kingdom of heaven. The weapons of his warfare were physical. Me and you have something different. We are operating under the spiritual kingdom of God. We don't physically hurt anybody for the gospel's sake. We have a weapon, though. It's the word of God, and we speak it. It fights our battles. And we are bold in our weapon, and we use it with confidence. And when we do that, immediately the wicked will jump up and say, you think you're right and everybody else is wrong. Technically, I do believe I'm right because I believe the Bible is right and everyone else outside of the Bible is wrong. I'm just going by what the Bible says. It says, let God be true, but every man a liar. So Elijah, he slew all the false prophets of Baal. Why was it necessary? These were obviously men that were going to keep leading people to hell. But they would have looked at him and said, you just think you're right and we're all wrong. You're just going to kill us. Elijah slew hundreds of prophets. Can you imagine the effect it had on him seeing all of that? I mean, Elijah is a different kind of character under a different time period. There are some things he did that we can't do and wouldn't do. There are some things we do that he couldn't do. We can use the Word of God to expose false prophets and get rid of their false teachings that way. But you must realize we don't hurt, physically hurt anyone for the gospel's sake. We preach the truth and pray that people believe it. You know what else? The eyes of the wicked say, they sarcastically say, well, you're right. Well, you think you're right and everyone else is wrong. They also say, your rain isn't coming. Because they believe it's a fairy tale. So they say, your rain's not coming. The rain's not really coming. In 1 Kings 18, 41, Elijah said unto Ahab, get thee up and eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Now, you know that Elijah had the rain stopped for three and a half years, but now the rain is coming. 1 Kings 18, 42 through 43. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth, and he put his face between his knees and said, unto, said to his servant, Go up now and look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. Then, now the number seven shows up, a picture of the trib, which is most likely seven years. Now, verse 44 and 45, And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, saying to Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. It came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. One of these days, men are going to look up and see lightning and thundering and clouds are going to be moving. And the book of Revelation says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. All this time they have heard the Bible believers say, Get right because Jesus is coming soon. And all they've been saying is, Yeah, right. The rain isn't coming. And they deny the rain over and over. And 1 Kings eighteen forty six, And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. And he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. By the way it's worded, it looks like Elijah outran the chariot just like jonah got to nineveh in a day even though it was a three days journey but that's the end for this lesson and we'll pick up with the rest of the story next week